guys hope your long weekend was a lot of fun and filled with lots of love see what i did there uh i thought it was funny uh but honestly for me uh i've never been in a relationship on valentine's day uh except for this year um it was a really brand new experience and uh honestly her name is calculus and she's just so beautiful uh just wanted to be super and open and honest with you guys about that. Uh, we did some implicit differentiation yesterday, you know. Got pretty hot and heavy, if I should say so myself. Uh, so it was a fun Valentine's Day. Also got this uh, new haircut. Uh, so no more long hair, Changavi. Uh, new haircut, new me, right? So a uh, new podcast. Um, anyway, back to why we are all here. Uh, the podcast for this week. Uh, this week on the podcast, I wanted to learn something new. Uh, rather than talk about what I already know. And so I decided to talk about the one thing I have no clue about, and that's dance and rhythm. Uh, but more specifically, uh, Indian classical dancing. This week we're talking all things Bharatanatyam, and the essential question is, how do dance and creativity intersect? In South Indian classical dance, and well, Indian classical dance in particular, uh, there's a there tends to be a lack of creative expression a lot of the time, and it's very structured. So I'm trying to see what the intersection is between the creative creativity, and uh, that was really just a, a fascinating a fascinating thought that I had. So to talk about this question, I brought on one of the most experienced dancers that I know, Sanjana Melkode. Sanjana has been dancing her entire life, basically, and knows about all of the things when it comes to Bharatanatyam and Indian dancing. She completed her Arn Gatrim back in 2017, which is considered to be one of the big milestones in an individual's journey within class Indian classical dance. We also talk about the process to get to that Arn Gatrim point and all the steps that she took in order to achieve a successful Arn Gatrim. In addition, we also talk about what Sanjana has been up to post Arn Gatrim and through college with creating shows and mashups with American influences mixed with Bharatanatyam to help better connect Indian Americans as well as make sure more people in America understand the beauty of Indian classical dance. Her YouTube channel will be linked down below, so feel free to go check that out. Uh, and with that, enjoy the episode. Cue it up. Coming to you live from my parents' house in my upstairs bedroom, we got episode 12 of the Essential Question podcast, and we're talking all things Barthenatium today for the culture. We brought on, and I brought on one of my good friends from high school. Sanjana, how are you doing? Doing good. How are you? Chilling, chilling. Best as I can be. It's really nice outside. So, you know, I'm getting good lighting, which is cool. You know, hashtag golden hour. So, you know, got it. <laughs> got to do it for the podcast. So, but yeah, what have you been up to? How's the, uh, how's the quarantine? How's, uh, how's everything still sane? Still uh, doing good? Yeah, I was like, honestly, kind of losing my sanity. But then we got a puppy over quarantine. And like, that oh. just uplifted my entire stay at home experience that's so awesome. i'm doing what's, good now what's the breed what's what's the breed of your puppy we got a golden lab oh okay what's the name i need to know the name his, okay so his name is scooter and my cousins got like his brother and they named him auto like scooter and auto rickshaw oh oh a little 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 indian american reference that i like it i'm a fan i'm a fan of this uh he sounds cute. Yeah, it's good to have a puppy. Um, but the essential question we're talking about today is not about golden labradoodles, unfortunately, as much as I would like to talk about them. Uh, it is about how do Indian dancing and creativity intersect? I know, a little intellectual for me, but, you know, I had to, had to do it, uh, since, especially since Sanjana has been kind of popping off on YouTube recently. So, uh, you know, she's kind of famous, guys. You know, watch out. Um, I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, bro. I've seen your videos, like 600 views, 800 views, like shit. You're, you're kind of popping. The Bay isn't oh going to see God. what hit him. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we get started with a little bit of the, uh, the, or the real stuff, uh, I just give the people like a two sentence Wikipedia summary of like who you are just real quick. Whoa, that's a lot of pressure. Okay, um, I'm Sanjana. <laughs> I'm a second year studying at UC Berkeley. I'm studying cognitive science and dancing on the side. There you go. See, totally worked. 
Um, but yes, she is a dancer, but what she's not telling you is that she dances in like one of the hardest, or she does like one of the hardest styles of dancing and like it takes an incredible amount of training, but we'll get into all that a little later. But to open Sanjana up a little bit and to, to get her laughing, uh, I'm going to do our classic little rapid fire intro as I've come to be known for. Uh, usually we do like a theme for everyone. So like, depending on the person, like last time we had Brian on, so we did a rap theme and this time it should be a dance theme, but your boy has absolutely no knowledge on dance. And so that's why I brought Sanjana on to educate me. So what we're going to do is we're going to do favorites. That's going to be our theme for this week's rapid fire intro. So you ready? You ready for the test? All right. I guess I'm, I guess I have to be ready. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you got to, you know, you got to, it's going to keep you on your toes here. All right. So question number one, what's your favorite genre of music? All right. Um, I feel like I don't actually listen to music outside of like dance music. So I have to say like Bollywood, um, especially because in high school, like that's literally all I did um, for Bombay in the Bay. But yeah, Bollywood. Shout out. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, Bollywood's like up there. Like if you were to look at my Spotify, like in my top like five genres, I think Bollywood's in the top five, you know? Yeah, I, think... I don't know. This is like super on brand, but like any music I can dance to is like music I'll listen to. If I yeah. can't dance to it, like it's not really. So you're basically just like bangers only. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's your, uh, that's your favorite genre of music. Yeah. What kind of Bollywood music do you like? Do you like the slower, like simpier songs or like, are you a big, like you know, like, give me all the drum breaks and the fucking hype beast bunger songs, like, um, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like, I, like, I like all of it, um, definitely, like, I grew to love bunger as I learned it, like, it is so hype, yeah, bunger is very hype, especially when you put bunger over hip-hop, my god, oh, yeah, yeah, it makes a brown boy's head explode, um, <laughs> it's incredible, especially Drake, Drake and bunger is, like, the best combination, it's, like, fucking peanut butter and jelly, it's too good, <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, favorite, uh, my second question is, uh, favorite like rapper or artist, uh, do you have any in mind? Like, it doesn't have to be a rapper. I just put rapper there. Cause I mean, I do listen to majority rap, but, um, this is where you're going to have to educate me because I literally don't <laughs> listen to you don't have a favorite. No, I, you don't have to answer favorite rapper. I said favorite artist. So it could be like a singer. Like it could be Lana Del Rey, you know, I don't know your type, but Okay, this is where I get like extremely exposed because I don't listen to American music like at all. Really? So <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I I've heard like some of the mainstream stuff, but I honestly like just don't like actively listen to that because when I work and stuff, like I can't listen to music and work at the same time because I get really? too distracted. Dude. Um, which I know for a lot of people it helps them focus, but I literally can't because I have the attention span of like it's terrible see so. what, yeah i mean sorry to cut you off but like what i've noticed with like my listening to music is that like if i listen to like bangers it's just it's over it's like i can't study but like when I, if i have to i can listen to like slower songs or like you know that's why i like studied a lot of lana del rey and a lot of tame impala and all that stuff you know because it's like it's like calming I, it's like i'm not you know jamming out to this but fucking j cole or drake comes on it's like it's over anyway yeah Honestly, so like i am currently at home so i my roommate is my six-year-old brother so i can't like play any like proper music out loud either so i basically just like listen to whatever first grade music he's listening to and that stuff gets stuck in my head so i'm like kind of losing my mind i feel it what's the what's the song of the week <laughs> He, like he plays this one video game that plays this like farmhouse song and it's like with like a banjo and everything and like I literally sing that to myself so much because it gets stuck in my head is he I don't know why yeah is he at the stage where he's exposing myself right now <laughs> it's all good at the essential question podcast we love younger children so we're fans <laughs> uh but uh that came off really wrong but uh anyway um but does he is he at the stage where he likes like all like the the Nickelodeon shows like the the backyard agains and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, okay, we watched Avatar together, which was really fun. Um, yeah. we watched Avatar and Korra together, and like all got super obsessed with that. Like even my dad got into that. Um, <laughs> That's so dope. But yeah, he's like he's really into Peppa Pig right now. Oh my god. <laughs> That's a oh little my beyond my time. I never was like into Peppa Pig as a child. 
but you know i, I watched a like, lot of backyard against and dora I, I remember i did too i was a big i was a big dora fan Staple. caillou caillou oh caillou. my god yeah yeah i wanted to be a kid who was four and each day i grew some more but you know bars. <laughs> arthur too forgetting arthur yes arthur's straight bars dude um and then the third question what's your been your like favorite quarantine tv show because i know a lot of people have like their their favorites or like something they found in quarantine that they're like holy shit this is the goatest tv show i've ever seen in my life so what's that been like for you do you have any um so i i watched avatar over quarantine i'd never seen it before so i feel like avatar kind of blew my mind um, I also rewatch New Girl like twice in quarantine. That's like Same. my all time favorite show. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely agree with you uh, on New Girl. I, I Like every time like I'm bored or something and I have like no TV to watch. I just go back to New Girl or I go back to Friends, like just comfort shows. Um, yes. But yeah, who's your favorite? Who represents your uh, New Girl character? Or like who, which New Girl character are you? Okay, so I took a test and I got Jess, which makes me really disappointed because she's like the most like mainstream out of all of them. I feel like yeah. I love all of them though. Like Winston is just so weird and like Schmidt is so aggressive and Cece's like put together but not at the same time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could see it. I could see you being Jess. You like give Jess vibes. Ugh, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. That's not a bad thing. Jess is a cool character, bro. I guess, yeah. Yeah. She starts off kind of a lot, though. Like, I feel like... Yeah. like oh, no, like, like, at first, I feel like they're trying to figure out what they wanted to do with the character. Right, but yeah. But then, like, once, like, Zoe Deschanel, who's, like, absolutely perfect for the role, just, like, grew into it, like, it just... It became, like, Jess is just the best. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I like to say I'm very much, like, a cross between Nick and Schmidt. That's, like, who I am. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The only reason I would equate you with like Robbie is because you both are super tall. Oh, but... Robbie, ew, <laughs> dude, not but Robbie, no. dude. Now all my friends are gonna listen to this and be like, "You are Robbie." No, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. You can just you can just cut it out, right? I would be like, "Dude, I got CC for a bit, so shut up." Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, New Girl is always a classic. Okay, so here's a question I think you'll be able to answer. I put it in here because I know how much you love the culture. So I said, favorite Indian food? If you had to pick one, what would it be? Oh my God, for sure, Pani Puri. Like I could live off of that stuff. That's a good one. Yeah, no, Pani Puri is very good. Like just high quality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately with like COVID and stuff, you can't go to like the chat trucks as much as we've been able to use. I know. To, right. And like those places you know. are actually so unsanitary. They just like <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I don't know about that. It's like I, I don't know about COVID, COVID safe. I don't know if it's COVID safe, yeah. but gotta make them at home, you know. Have you done that during quarantine? Yeah, yeah. My my mom made a bunch at home and like yeah, we feasted. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is they make a mess sometimes if you like fucking take a bite and then you just don't put the whole thing in your mouth. Wait, and no, that's like falls. actually illegal. You have to put the whole thing in your mouth at once. Like, Yeah, I've, I've done that on accident. Like just been like, oh, I'm gonna take one. Cause it's, sometimes it's like hella watery. It's like, holy shit. Am I going to be able to fit this in my mouth? So you take one bite and then like shit starts falling out. So you're like, oh no. <laughs> no, like the fear, you know, like the uncertainty, it's all part of the experience. Like you just have to trust and do it. No, for sure. It's just fucking just go for it. <laughs> done. You know, but uh, unfortunately I haven't done that in the past. I'm gonna get better. That's my new year's resolution, Sanjana. You got to keep me to it. All right. Uh, got to eat Pani Puri right. Uh, okay. Favorite actor or public figure so it could be bollywood it could be hollywood it can be you know none of those things it can be a scientist who is it um let's see okay i love zendaya like she's like an amazing actor an amazing dancer like a beautiful human being like by far my idol i i would agree with you on this and she's from the bay area by the way so shout out yeah uh but uh yeah no she's she's awesome did you like watch euphoria is that how you are you just like been into her since like her disney channel stuff yeah i basically grew up watching shake it up and I, like oh, me and my okay. best friend were like we need to be cc and rocky like dance stars um but yeah I, I first saw her on shake it up and then like i just have followed her like throughout her entire glow up like from disney channel to now yeah. 
Um, it's crazy that like she was on Disney Channel and doing all this upbeat shit, and now she's like a fucking coke addict on Euphoria. It's it's crazy. Yeah, it's like, she's she's so but she's good. amazing at it. She's amazing. Yeah, she she's a great actress. Yeah, um, yeah. If you haven't gone and seen Euphoria, go see it. But you know, do so with an uh, open mind, to say the least. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, favorite social media platform. I know you're not very big into social media. I presume. I presume yeah, you know, like the Instagram type but, yes uh, actually i get favorite? a lot of like hate from my friends because i don't post anything on instagram but like <laughs> I, we made our like fuchsia dance account and i've been posting yeah. so much on there because and like it's funny because my friend who started fuchsia with me we like we both have zero posts on our personal instagram <laughs> so we were like how do you post on instagram like how do you make a facebook page like i've been searching this up on yeah. google like i'm an actual grandma um i feel but, the same way like <laughs> yeah yeah because like even with the podcast right like i don't like you've seen my instagram like the the two pictures i have up are from like seventh grade they're blurry vacation photos and then like i suddenly like i, I was like you know what and then i had to like advertise my podcast so i had to fucking post something and i was like i have no attractive pictures of myself or of anything so i literally posted a picture of mongolian barbecue and my friends gave me so much shit for it they were like you idiot like blah 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 blah, blah. like this is you know like whatever but i because i was like i'm going with my instagram aesthetic of like shitty so like i was like i'm just gonna go with it um and then you know with, with but with the podcast like yeah i have to continue to post but like i agree with you i have to search up like how do you post like what's a story like oh shit is this gonna delete like no like i didn't want that <laughs> Yeah, I, I think like for our first video, I posted it like three times and took it down three times because I kept messing up like the cover photo or the description, yeah. right? It tagged the right person. And I was like, I'm so over this. Yeah, dude, it's hard, bro. Honestly, social media influencers, dude, like they put in they put in the work. They got to They got to yeah. know like their platforms. It's so hard to like make the content and then market the content and then yeah. like, share it with everybody like that. <laughs> yeah, I kind of just want to make the content, hand it off like just to right. the internet to deal yeah. with it <laughs> unfortunately that just doesn't work that way i wish it did i, I wish the internet was like just disperse the content for you yeah i know but yeah marketing it is the worst dude oh my god I, the way i used to like market my shit like because i used to have a blog before the podcast yeah i like, remember dude i used to fucking spam message people and i'm pretty sure they fucking hated me like i was like hey read it and they're like no i'm like dude <laughs> what? <laughs> what i'm just like ah oh, like this is so annoying but like so finally i've gotten to the point where i'm like all right fuck it i'm not gonna spam anyone for the podcast or anything so i've just i put it out there i'm like if you want to listen go ahead and listen <laughs> I remember the vlog days, oh, um, but your blog posts were great and your podcast episodes are awesome too. Yeah, so. I try, I try, I try, you know, gotta, gotta create good content for everybody. Um, this one's a little interesting. Uh, I was listening to sports radio the other day, as I normally do. Uh, and they were asking this question. They posed this question. I've actually given this question a lot of thought. Uh, it's, it's very deep. It's very intellectual. Uh, what's your favorite condiment? um that's a very good question yeah. um I, this was an icebreaker for like um one of the clubs i'm in and it got like really heated because people yeah. feel really so like i feel like this is a make or break moment um yeah i'll kick you off right now no. <laughs> <laughs> let's see oh okay i really like honey mustard okay okay i can get with that yeah i mean like do you put it on everything like bread sandwiches like I feel like sandwiches and burgers, it works. I'm not oh, like works really insane well. yeah. about it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I think it works with fries. It can work with fries too. I've never yeah. had it with fries, but. You should try it. But Mine... I feel like it makes every burger better. Like it's way better than regular mustard. For right, sure. for sure. Cause it's like, I don't know, like it depends. Like, especially if you have like, depends. I don't know if you're vegetarian or you eat meat, but if you have like the, uh, like, like a chicken sandwich and you put a little honey mustard on it, oof, that shit is fire it's great it's great um but man i mean i actually did a lot of thinking about it i was like what is it Anuj? like what what is your favorite and honestly my go-to condiment this may get a lot of hate and i know there's a lot of haters for this condiment ranch bro ranch, ranch is, is fire pizza fries any pretty much anything most things you can eat with ranch i mean even like yeah, it's just ranches. I mean, salad. Like, ranch is just 
goaded. Like, I don't yeah. care. I don't care who you are. Like, I, I ranch is just really good. And I'll die on yeah, that hill. Yeah, it's like really versatile for sure. Yeah. It doesn't go with like sweet stuff, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> oh, but God, uh, no. yeah. But also Trader Joe's ranch guys, trash. It's the worst thing I've ever had in my life. Trader Joe's ranch is so bad. Please don't get Trader Joe's ranch. My mom bought it and it's the only ranch we have right now. Terrible. Terrible. It's like sugary. It's gross. What makes it like taste different? I don't know. It's like, it, you just have to have it. It's like sweet. I'm just like, it's it's not the same like buttermilk ranch that I'm used to from like a Hidden Valley, mm-hmm. right? Hidden Valley is classic. Like, but the ranch that you get from like Trader Joe's, it's just, it tastes a lot sweeter. It's just very, uh, you know, so. My but dad you like, like made homemade ranch once. It was pretty good. That's cool. You know what I also like? Thousand Island. Thousand Island is is up there for me too. Yeah. So definitely uh favorite favorite dressings. Uh and then second to last question. Or no, last question. So like everyone's got their own like favorite order when they go to a restaurant. So what's yours? What's your go-to order? Any restaurant could be Chipotle, McDonald's, what is it? Wait like any restaurant like it has to be an order that could be at any restaurant like, i'm like- thinking like mostly like fast food like what's your what's your go-to like mcdonald's order or like starbucks order? but i didn't know like what's fast food you ate so i was like i'll keep it open well this is the thing like as a vegetarian like fast food's kind of difficult because like there's it, yeah. there's literally just the veggie burger and fries <laughs> so like that yeah. is kind of by default my favorite order but i i love to get like the milkshakes that's fair like, milkshakes are so good yeah. the chocolate milkshakes damn vegetarian life was so hard i did it for 14 years oh man (laughs) never ever go back (laughs) i don't i don't mind it but yeah i feel like like especially like college first year dining hall like that was such a struggle like i'm i will never eat vegetable lasagna again (laughs) have you ever like have you uh have you like like been curious with me or like tried it yeah so okay yeah I've tried chicken and fish before I didn't really like fish like I feel like chicken was also like oh it was pretty good I don't know like I haven't eaten too much too many like crazy things um but I I wasn't like such a huge fan where I was like oh I can like switch my entire eating habit to like include this I was like it's kind of like it's good but it's yeah not nothing like I don't know are your parents also vegetarian too yeah, my parents are vegetarian, okay. but they, they like my dad is like they both have tried meat and like so they let us all try meat. My brothers eat meat, but like oh, okay. I just For didn't sure. really like it. So I was like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. No, I mean that that makes sense. Like, I mean, my parents are like vegetarian, but more for like moral reasons. And like my dad used to eat meat back in the day. So he doesn't like they don't really care if we eat, but yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's just some I'm so used to being vegetarian and like my mom's vegetarian food is so good, but yeah. Like as long as I can learn to make food like that, I think I'll be set. But yeah, like vegetarian sure. food just like out in the world can sometimes be rough. Yeah, no, I get it. Um, but like with, yeah, I mean like at home, like with if with your parents, like vegetarian food's so easy. Cause I mean, Indian food, it's vegetarian. is like, if you're at an Indian restaurant and you need vegetarian food, like there's so many things you can get. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, Cause it's like so based it's, off the vegetarian diet. Exactly, right? Particularly if you're South Indian, like, I mean, three fourths of our food is literally- Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. So you don't need to like change anything or, mm-hmm. you know, any of that. Uh, but that's it for our rapid fire questions. You did well. Um, you know, I'll give did it a I pass the test? I think you passed. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, is it a Saratoga pass? I don't know. We'll see. Oh, yikes. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, uh, but yeah, you did, you did well. Uh, you did quite swell, uh, if I should say so myself. Um, but let's get into uh, the, the Bardanantian stuff. Um, so I just wanted to give a little context as to what I found on doing my homework on the internet, as I do, because I'm a good student. Stay in school, kids. Uh So what I found, and you can feel free to add in because you're the expert here. Uh, So like I did some research and I found out that like the dance is actually over 2000 years old. uh, And it was actually originally performed in the temples in South India. So it's a very South Indian thing. We love that. Both South Indians on the podcast, shout out. Um, And the original purpose of Bharatanatyam was to educate the public through dance about like the various religious scriptures and stories uh that were going on do you have anything else to add or anything or 
now. Yeah, that's like, yeah, you're right about it being a very, very South Indian um, art form. Um, yeah, it started off in the temples as a way to kind of like personify and showcase the stories that were kind of passed down through oral tradition. And then um, as time went on, as like the like era of the kings and the courts um, came in, um, a lot of times like these dancers, these dancers would dance in the court for the king. So there was that era too. And then after that, it kind of became more like a modern like home practice where like a lot of people like um, learned it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's super cool. I mean, so it's basically like it's evolved through time, essentially. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, that's that's super cool. Uh, so like what like let's take it back to the very beginning. Like we're talking like when you first started, like what got you into it? Was it like parental influence or like were you just a natural like what did you just love dancing and like your parents kind of pushed you in that direction? Like what was the uh, what was the catalyst for all of this? Yeah, so I was like, I've always loved dancing. According to my parents, like I would dance a lot as like a little kid, just like at home, I'd be like dancing to whatever music they put on. So my parents were like, oh, let's try to enroll her in some kind of dance class, like see if she likes it. And funny story, I actually went to my first dance class when I was like four years old. And the teacher was like, oh, can you do like a small hand movement? And I just like stared at her and I refused to move. Like I was just like, I, I'm a rock right now. <laughs> and she like tried so hard to get me to dance and um, I just didn't. And then she told my mom, she's like, I don't think your daughter like is like, interested in dancing and then I then my mom took me home and like as soon as we got home I started dancing again so my mom was like literally what happened to you in that class yeah. so I um I took like a year break I think I was just really shy but then I went back a year later and I actually really liked it um and then as a little kid I did Bharatanatyam but Bharatanatyam is like really really like technique heavy like for requires sure. a lot of discipline mm -hmm. so, so I also did Bollywood on the like on the side for fun which I found a lot more fun so I started off learning Bollywood and Bharatanatyam together um and I enjoyed dance a lot more with Bollywood because it was like more free-flowing and you can just do whatever you want but then in Bharatanatyam yeah. there's so many like fundamentals and rules that you have to follow yeah. so as a little kid I was kind of like wow this is a lot but I made some good friends in dance class which I think kept me going back yeah um but yeah like I, that's how I got started yeah because like I've always known Bharatanatyam is like being a very structured process it's like you have to do x y and z to get to the R engagement which is like the culminating thing and then like it's so I felt like it was like more so than like an art form it almost felt like it was very like rigid and like there wasn't like any room for creativity is that necessarily true or like did you have did you feel like you have the creative space to like kind of improv and do your own thing yeah, I feel like definitely now I have that like creative space to do whatever I want, but it definitely comes after years of paying your dues and like learning the structure of the art form. And I feel like um, as a little kid, that was pretty hard. And I remember in middle school, like I think everybody goes through this when you have to spend like 14, 15 years before you feel like, OK, I kind of have a grasp of how to do this style properly and create. Um, I like in middle school, like I absolutely wanted to quit. I was like, this is just not fun. I'm just learning piece after piece. And yeah, like I didn't relate to any of the stories about mm -hmm. like gods or things in India. And like, I guess like my parents kind of like brought me up like with these stories and values. So I, I related in that way, but it was like none of my school friends really cared about this. Like nobody like thought it was cool. So I, I, I like really wanted to quit and be like a ballet dancer, like something more relatable to yeah. America, right? Um, but then I think high school came around and yeah, I did my Arangetram, which I think the misconception is that it's this huge culmination end all be all graduation kind of thing. Right, right. For me, it was like really the beginning. Like it was the first time where my teacher was like, here's a story. How would you want to express it? Like, what do you think? Like, how can you relate this to your life? Like, so I did this piece, like my main piece was about Devi, who's like the female goddess. Mm -hmm. And then like aspects of Devi, like she's, uh, she's the mother of the youth universe she um teaches art she's um somebody that like gives wealth if you pray so it's like you have to think about like how can I connect this to my life so like the mother of the universe like obviously my mom my grandma like people that inspire me like my teacher my dance teacher so it's like I was able to like bring those aspects into my real life and then the stories became easier to showcase and um I think that's like how I first got really interested in choreography because my teacher did actually a really good thing and she, when she was choreographing she would like sh like choreograph like on me in front of me so she'd create the piece like 
as I was in class. So I got to see like the storytelling process. And I realized that like Bharatanatyam is just you and any dance. It's like you just take a story and you translate it to movement. Like just because it's a dance form from India doesn't mean you can't do the same thing. Like doesn't mean it's restricted to these stories of gods and like ancient things. You can definitely tell modern stories. So that's like what I learned as I was doing my Adangetram. And I think for, for me, the Adangetram was like my first like real big performance where I was like, wait, I can actually do something really substantial mm -hmm. with dance. Yeah. It so definitely like, wasn't like the last. Yeah. So like you basically just gave like the whole summary of everything, which is dope. And like, I think that's, I mean, I, I think for like people that don't know, like Bharatanatyam is like an incredibly like, rigorous process that takes like years upon years upon years of just like blood sweat and tears like trying to learn those fundamentals like Sanjana was saying so like take us kind of through like the process like what are kind of the stages that you go through as like a Bharatanatyam dancer like when do they know like oh you're ready to do the art and gate room? and like how do you what's the process like what's the preparation like yeah so um the first three years of learning the the dance like you just learn steps like it's literally you don't even touch music till your fourth year which for me I was like as a little kid too I was like I want to dance to songs not to my teacher telling me to hit my foot on the ground right mm -hmm. so you learn technique for the first three years and then you learn basics basic songs um uh and I learned like from like the more basic songs to the more advanced songs. Like I learned that till high school. Um, the first couple songs start out with just technique. So it's like the steps you learn, you put it together and you learn a song. And then as you get a little more advanced, there's expressive pieces, which I think is like the real, real beauty of Bharatanatyam is like, you can express stories. Like it's a very much a storytelling based art form. Like all of the um, expressive side of the dance is like based off of stories. So that's where I really started to get interested because I was like, these are like, I could pick any story. And as long as I know the technique, I can translate it to movement. Um, right. And then high school, that's when I learned, like I learned more advanced, like storytelling based pieces. And it's actually really interesting now I'm still learning. So now like that I'm in college and like, you know, I guess have been like, was on my own for like a couple semesters before coming back home. My teacher has started to teach us like more pieces about like that relate to your personal life. So it's like pieces of like, it's actually not structured around a God or anything. It's just like the, it's called the hero. Like the person of the dance is like the hero and it's like an experience they, they go through. So it's like, we learned, we learned one piece about like this girl, like flirting with this guy, trying to get him to, to like, like hang out with her and it's like yeah. that's like something we probably would experience like as young adults right and then mm -hmm. there's like another story of like um like a father who lost his daughter like whose daughter passed away and it's like grieving over those emotions so it's like you realize like a lot of the more advanced pieces are really like everyday experiences or like things that any normal human could experience and I think like right now like figuring that out and being able to relate stories to my life has been like where I am currently but yeah, yeah, that's like the process. It takes a long time to get there for sure. Yeah, no, like that's... I'm still not like too good at it. Like it's yeah. definitely still a learning process. I feel that. I mean, that's definitely super interesting because my always conception of Bharatanatyam was like, every time I would go to the R and room, I'd be like, all right, this is like their end all performance. Like my mom would, my mom was like, oh, like this is, do you understand how much work they put into this? And you're just like, you don't do anything. And I was like, well, okay, that's besides the point. But, you know, like, and so like, we would just, I would watch these performances and I'd watch them kind of, I'd watch like the dancers out there, like tell this story. And like, I would have no context to the story. So like, I was very bored. And like, I would just kind of just watch them like dance. And I'd be like, what is going on? And my, I would be like, mom, explain it to me. And she'd be like, shut up, watch. And I'm like, okay, like, this is not gonna help. But like, that's super interesting that, now that you are like past the R and room and past that whole like the foundational thing, like I didn't know that it continues on. I thought you were just kind of done. I thought it was like, oh, you're done. Like there you go. Now you have all the skills. Like, oh no way. I don't think like with any like dance or music or art or like anything, right? Like you never have all the skills, right? And I For feel sure. like that's a core mindset. Like anybody practicing any art needs to have, right? It's like I, I'm always going to be learning. Yeah. No, that's, that's crazy. Like, so like after your R and room, like, do you kind of just like go still go to class? Like, or is it more so like you just kind of practice and like do your own things on your own time or like, 
Yeah, so after Arangetram, at least my teacher, she had like a post Arangetram class where like all the girls who had done their Arangetram would learn more advanced pieces. So I, I always attended that class and I felt like I was learning, but I also felt like after putting in all that time for my Arangetram, like I'm capable of making things on my own. And my teacher encouraged us to do this too. Um, is like we like I started thinking about like what stories do I want to tell and actually like a lot of my friends in high school like a lot of you guys I actually learned this a lot from Bombay in the Bay um like everybody everybody likes to dance and watch dance but because Bharatanatyam has that like language barrier I guess it's kind of a language barrier where it's like you know there's a story going on but you don't know how to translate the story right because right. it's like you, you don't know those like fundamental technique things that you need to know to be able to translate Bharatanatyam to a story. I was thinking like, how can I, how can I create like pieces that don't need, don't have that translation barrier, right? Where it's like, it's, it's accessible enough to where somebody who doesn't know Bharatanatyam can watch it and kind of understand what's going on. But at mm -hmm. the same time, it's still Bharatanatyam. So that like, after my Arangetram, that kind of became my like, purpose like as a dancer like I was like I this is something I definitely want to do and then so I did my Edinburgh in 2017 so sophomore year of high school and then junior year I started working on a show called Jivana which was my first like self-choreographed show and I basically partnered with this organization in India called Smile Foundation and they had uh, a, a health campaign where they um, basically are raising money to create mobile hospitals for to go to rural areas in India and provide health care so I was like, I want to fundraise for this organization and work with them through dance. And I want to create awareness and accessibility through dance. So what I did was I sat down, I researched about this entire issue about like inaccessible healthcare in rural areas. And then I wrote a story about a girl who lives in the village and she, um, she basically grows up in the village with her best friend and they both love to dance together. And one day this girl gets a, um, gets a disease that like starts to kill her but because she has no um, access to healthcare, the disease kills her and it's like if she had access to healthcare, you know she would have survived and that's the whole point right that's mm -hmm. the whole reason we're raising money in the first place so i got together with two of my dance friends and we basically we, we wrote the story together and we started choreographing the piece and one of our one of my friends was the girl and then one of my friends was her best friend and then i was like the personified disease so we basically took this idea of a disease and we mm. made it a character like this really evil character that takes over your life and we took we basically like took Bharatanatyam choreography, but then added in like very simple aspects like puppeteering. So like I would go behind my friend and like, like pretend to move her hands around. So it's like this disease is controlling her, which is a pretty translatable like concept and right, movement, right? right? Yeah. And so, yeah, so we made that show and we made like a 30 minute show and we had um, one of my friends do an English voiceover. So it was like this girl t taking us through her story. Mm -hmm. And then we had music and inst completely instrumental music. So there was no, like you didn't need to understand the context of the lyrics or anything. And it has this English voiceover going through. And um, that was like my first, like, like trying to combine like a, a Western idea or like Western presentation with Bharatanatyam. Yeah. And ever since then, like, yeah, I've just been trying to make more choreographies that work that way. Yeah, no, honestly, like, I think that's so needed within our society, like, I particularly, I mean, like, as the Indian American kids, let alone, like, the rest of society, like, I feel like me, myself, like, I don't necessarily understand what Bharatanatyam is, and I feel like a show like that, you know, with the English voiceover, with all of this explanation would, like, get someone like me more interested and, like, more, like, inclined to learn more about the process and, like, about the dance and all of that, because, like, I mean, growing up, like I, you know, went to all the shows, but I never had any of that context or that information. And I think that's just, that's needed. And like, I feel like with more of us, like first generation kids coming up and going through all these processes and being able to kind of not Americanize it. Cause I feel like that's a little derogatory, but like, I feel like kind of put our own spin on it. Like, I feel like that's just going to, to benefit the culture, like even further. Yeah, for sure. I feel like as like Indian Americans, like you still need to be able to relate to it, especially because like, as I learned the pieces, like these are like super hardcore Indian stories. And I'm like, yeah, the Indian side of me relates to this. But like mm -hmm. the side of me that's grown up in America, like doesn't really like necessarily feel passionate about these stories. So it's like, sure. what are the stories that I witness in my day to day life? Like, I'd rather be dancing about those because I feel connected to those. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I know like, uh, what's it called? 
so like I know obviously with like the Barthanatium dance like you were talking about there's a lot of like religious undertones to it like how are you like a religious person and has like dance helped you connect to God if you are but if you're not like how have how has religion kind of played a role within the dance itself um yeah I, I wouldn't I, I honestly don't know. I don't think I'm religious, like personally. I think my my family's pretty religious. Mm-hmm. Like my grandparents live with us. My parents are religious. But even my parents, like we practice religious customs more for the tradition and the culture than it really like this connection to God. Like uh, at least for me, yeah. Like I think I value like the tradition and the fact that like this custom has been like practiced for so many years, and um, we're just like carrying that on. Um, but I feel like. I haven't really like I'm not like a super religious person where I feel like an in, like a really extreme connection to God. Um, and I think Bhartanatyam in the same way. Like I, I really like the art form because I love to dance and it's just like a way for me to continue dancing. But also, I really like the stories that come out of the dances and like even like even stories about gods like can relate to like our lives because at least like Hindu mythology is like very much personified like all these gods are people right so it's Mm -hmm. like they all had interactions we're all in situations like there are stories of like being strong or stories of being weak or stories of jealousy or stories of you know courage and like all those like morals and like values like obviously come in our lives so I think um Bharatanatyam has helped me connect with like the culture and the tradition but I don't necessarily think it's like made me more or less religious it's kind of like oh here's a set of stories and characters and values that these stories um bring that I just like have learned through the art form um but yeah I think it's definitely like like being like a Hindu and doing Bharatanatyam has like given me like a lot of discipline because as a little kid like sitting through pujas or like long dance performances you're like I literally do not know what's going on and could not care less but you have to sit there even though your feet are like completely falling asleep from like sitting in crisscross applesauce like for like three hours um (laughs) yeah that's me at 20 like it's nothing strange (laughs) I know it's still a struggle but like, I feel like it's given like some some kind of discipline right like you can sit there yeah. and just listen to somebody like go off in Sanskrit yeah for so long yeah, dude, <laughs> honestly so yeah I value that but I don't yeah. think like I don't think I have like a really like deep connection with God like probably other Hindus do yeah no I was just wondering because I mean I know it's like a very like and there is a lot of religious context to it. And I was just like curious. I mean, I didn't mean to put you on the spot when it came to religion. Oh, no, no. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, um, I, so obviously to, uh, to transition from that, uh, I've, again, did some more homework and I saw that there was actually like, I didn't really realize that there was like multiple different styles of like classical dance. So there's like Kathak and there's like a bunch of others that I can't name off the top of my head, eight different types, actually. And uh you specialized in Bharatanatyam so like do you know anything about the others and like is there overlap so like what what do kind of like some of the different styles entail and like what how does that all work um yeah I definitely am not an expert in the other styles I didn't even know there was a I can remember like four or five so there's there's Kathak, Kuchipudi, Bharatanatyam, Odissi, Mohiniyattam like okay that's like just a couple of them yeah yeah yeah. and the the main difference is like they stemmed in different parts of India right like they all started in different areas in India Mm -hmm. um I used to think they were all exactly the same because the costume <laughs> looks the same. Yeah. Um, but as I've like grown and obviously learned one of the art forms deeply, like they're so different. Um, just from small things, like in Bharatanatyam, a lot of times you just use dance, but then in Kuchipudi, like lip syncing is a really big aspect of it. And then in Bharatanatyam, like your core has to be straight the entire time. But in Odyssey, like waist movements is a really, really um, like, core part of the dance mm-hmm. and Bharatanatyam like moving your waist is like absolutely forbidden like it's all straight and like in one yeah. place but in in Odyssey it's like very controlled waist movement which literally like one of my really good friends does Odyssey and when she was doing those moves like I couldn't even do it because I've been trained to yeah. not move my waist at all um and uh obviously Kathak is like known for the spins right um Mm -hmm. Kathak is really different I would say from like Kuchipudi and Odyssey and Bharatanatyam I would say those are more similar and like Kathak is like I don't know much about Kathak but it's like it's absolutely beautiful I've always wanted to learn Kathak but I feel like I would spin out and fall over (laughs) 
Dude, no. I mean, like, I see, like that. Those are like subtleties. I feel like someone like me, who's like not very necessarily well educated within dance, would like realize. I feel like they all look the same. But like, that's crazy. That like, you have to keep your core straight the whole time. Like, what is the yeah. conditioning with that? Like, do you guys like have to work out and stuff? Like, um, I. I don't know. It's like you, the pieces we learn are like anywhere from three minutes to like 45 minutes. Like one piece can be 45 minutes. So being on stage and like being active and dancing for that long, I feel like it's conditioning in itself. Like um, right. those pieces are called varnams and they're like really long pieces that include mm -hmm. like a lot of technique and a lot of storytelling and expression. It's basically like everything together. So whenever we didn't have to stamina, my teacher would be like, go practice varnams because that's like one surefire way to first of all <laughs> die, but also like get really strong. It's like the basketball coach's version of go do suicides. Like, <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. That's crazy. 45 minutes. Like, yeah. wow. See, like, yeah, I bet like all the strict Bartonatium teachers like, don't make me make you do Varnums again. Like it's gonna, you know, like, and the yeah. was like, oh. <laughs> it's like, it's like a love-hate relationship because the piece itself is so complex. So it's really interesting to dance it. But at the same time, I'm like 20 minutes in, I'm like ready to call it quits. Yeah, <laughs> no, I feel it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So like, how are the are the dances so like obviously you grew up here in america and you learned bharatanatyam here in the united states so like is it different the way dances are taught in india versus they are here in the united states or is there a lot of overlay and similarity explain that i think there's a lot of overlay because my teacher is from india like she grew up in india and then mm -hmm. moved here to the bay area like a lot of our parents um yeah. So I feel like at least for this generation, there's a lot of overlay. It's very rooted in like oral format. Like the teacher can just, once once you learn all the techniques, so like each each step has its own like um, syllable or label, right? So like mm -hmm. my teacher can just sit there and list off like five labels and you should know those steps and you should just be able to dance it, which I think is insane. Cause when I was little, I was like, I don't know how people will do that. Like they just say five steps and you just know the combination. Like yeah. you don't even need to see it. Um, but now like as I can do that and that's like that's something I find really really cool like my teacher always says like you should just be able to learn from like listening to me talk and I feel like that's a really important skill like a skill you don't normally get like in a classroom for sure right? yeah um but yeah I think like that's definitely obviously like the teachers in India are super strict yeah um, yeah no I've heard <laughs> yeah so that's pretty intimidating like I've gone to a couple workshops with teachers from India and like man you you get humbled like right there <laughs> um but yeah I feel like the teaching style itself is pretty maintained like in India that I don't I think it's like it the, the the core aspect is like the audio learning just just being able to hear and learn and like yeah. see and learn too um it's not very much like written down like you write things down to memorize it later um but yeah my teacher always says like don't take a video like you should just know it like memory mm -hmm. is like a huge um skill to have especially if you're memorizing like a 20 40 minute dance like you yeah. have to keep that all in your brain you know why I'm laughing so much right now is because I used to, so me and Sanjana used to dance together in high school. We used to do Bombay in the Bay and I was the biggest fucking loser when it came to dancing. I was so bad. And I would complain to her all the time. Like, I don't know the dance. I didn't memorize it. I didn't watch the video. And then she's sitting here and talking about how she had to like memorize like an hour's worth of dancing, like as like a six year old. And I'm like, oh, I feel so bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh man that's so funny um but I know like you kind of alluded to it earlier uh the relationship between like the, I've heard from my like my parents and from like other adults in my life that have like done or participated in like the Bharatanatyam process they've said like the relationship between your teacher and like the student is like so important mm -hmm. so like describe that relationship and like what has it like been like for you and like how has how have you like grown from your teacher and stuff like that yeah I feel like that is one really big characteristic of like Indian art forms is like the, your teacher which is called like your guru mm -hmm. um and the student relationship is like so it's it's just like really involved so like obviously if the teacher or the student like doesn't like the other person it can be really tough because you spend a lot of time with them and many years with them too, right? Like you grow up with them. So I don't even remember meeting my teacher because I was so young. Like I don't really remember my first day of dance class because I was so small. Um, and I've all, like obviously grown up like 
um, in like really close contact with her. And I think of her like a second mom because of like how much time I've spent in her garage dancing or in the <laughs> dance studio, like um, dancing. Like my, my teacher's like seen me cry. Like she's called me out for not practicing. Like, I feel like I've gone through like, there's no like, there's no like side of me that my teacher hasn't seen just because like, especially like as I was training for my Adenge drum, like she pushes you to your physical like limit, right? With like having to do like an hour and a half, two hours worth of dance, like without stopping and right. managing high school, like especially like going to Saratoga High with like yeah. the intense workload and th having this on the side, like my teacher definitely gave me like a lot of advice, like in life, just like how to manage everything, like how to prioritize, like the importance of you know, like sticking to what's important to you, even though like other people might not be doing that. And um, she's definitely like a huge mentor in my life. So I have had like a really, really close relationship with my teacher and like, I still talk to her. Um, but I know like for a lot of others, like if, if the, like, if you don't like your teacher or your teacher for some reason doesn't like you, like that can be like a really bad situation because sure. like this relationship is such a close one. I mean, you're forced to spend so much time with them, right? You're, you literally have been with her for what, 15 years or something like, yeah, plus. exactly. So like, if you don't like them, like that's a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, especially when you're training for something like an RNG trim, which is like, you know, this long dance performance where you like are need to be pushed and like, you don't like the person that's cheap. Like, ah, it's just, yeah, I feel like that could be. Like, have you heard of like bad horror stories like that? I'm just like, your oh yeah, and... for sure. For sure. Like yeah. there's some stories that are like, like, oh, like my teacher didn't like me. And so I'm like having a horrible time in class every week, but there are also like other problems that are so serious. Like so many teachers um, I've heard like abuse, like the contract between the teacher and the student, whether that's like the financial contract, because they'll be like, I'm spending so much time with your student. Like I, you need to pay me more or like mm -hmm. even like an emotional contract, like you're allowing somebody to mold you in such a like, like personal way. Like so sure. many times, like, like emotional abuse is definitely a thing in like Indian art forms. And like, in like the worst of cases, because like the nature of the relationship is like the student goes to the teacher's home and learns from them. The teacher like feeds the student. It's like a very, very like a family kind of thing. Right. Like, it right. can definitely be completely abused. And like, I've heard stories of like sexual assault. Like it's, it's definitely not like, like th those instances are there and it's like definitely yeah. not okay. I mean, that's awful. I mean, yeah. but like, that's, that's the thing is like, it's so ingrained in the culture, right? It's like Indian culture in general. And I'm not saying like, well, yeah. I mean, I think Indian culture in general is so familial and it's so like unit based mm -hmm. and like everything like, and I've always said this, like everything that like, I feel like brown people do is just so like, they go either, they either don't do it or they go the full like 100 yards. Exactly. Like it's so it's like, you're bringing everyone with you and like, you're going to make sure that like, you know, that like it's very tight. And so like, obviously like with that close proximity, a lot of the time you get a lot of these issues that do happen and you know personalities don't get along and that can obviously mold itself into other things yeah I feel like that's one thing that kind of needs to change about this whole thing it's like yes a close relationship is really good but like one mm -hmm. thing about like I've seen like an American like education system it's like we're in a professional relationship like I'm here to teach you you're here to learn it doesn't For need sure. to be deeper than that right um obviously like if it can be it's like it's definitely good like obviously like you know like teachers that we have become friends with like those relationships are like definitely yeah. ones that I value but it's like you don't need to force that because sometimes that can tread a really really thin line and like I'd rather not end up in like a bad situation just definitely. because of this forced closeness definitely yeah no that's that's super interesting I never really thought about it from that like perspective of like how in America we're kind of like with our teachers with our like it's kind of more of like it starts off very professional it's like I'm just you know here to give you the information and we'll see what happens afterwards and it's like whatever you make of it and if you guys get along but like I feel like with India everything is just kind of like forced into like you know it's like with family too it's like oh this is your fifth cousin but like he's your he's basically your brother so like you know it's just like exactly that, that's it's just what it is but like you know it's it's a good part of the culture but it also has that double-edged sword for sure yeah um, definitely so you were talking earlier about like the different costumes and stuff and the saris that are worn during the performances is there like a significance behind them or like do you guys have costume changes in the middle like what's what's the story with with those um i mean so at least for Bart and I'm like we just convert like a sari like the original costume is a sari that's like wrapped in a way that makes it like suitable to dance and um that's basically what it is it's 
it's so heavy honestly like I can dance like in normal workout clothes and be fine but then I wear the costume and I feel like I've lost like half my energy because there's like a million jewels on my head like I have to put fake hair to make my hair look longer really yeah so so you braid your hair and you're the braid is supposed to go all the way down to like your waist and like my hair is not down to my waist so I Mm. like you have to you have to braid fake hair in um and yeah there's like so much jewelry like anywhere like there's like three part there's like a three part earring there's like like hair jewelry like there's braid jewelry there's bangles there's bells like it's so heavy but like at the same time it's really pretty but I'm also like I weigh like 15 more pounds than I did yeah. before I put this on no I, I feel that it's just like I feel like it's almost like extra like body weight just weighing you down and you have to like you know figure out a way to like maneuver through it that's that's crazy wow i can't even imagine that like fake hair too you have to explain the story behind that i need to i need to hear like what the fake hair was like like did you feel like it was gonna fall off at a certain point like actually yeah like for the first like well okay so i've always had long hair like high school middle school elementary Mm -hmm. school like i wasn't like i was literally forbidden to cut my hair so i've never had short hair um because of that because my mom and my dance teacher would be like if you cut your hair like putting in the fake hair will be a nightmare so they're like if you cut your hair you better quit dance and i was just like okay wow no pressure there so yeah definitely like i've always had long hair because of that because it's like the goal is to not need the fake hair but obviously nobody's hair gets long enough for that yeah yeah um but yeah i think like it's super super heavy so like i honestly like take like two advils before like getting ready for a dance performance and also not to mention getting ready it takes like two hours for a performance and like sometimes like i'll dance for just like 10 minutes but i spent like most of my day getting ready for that 10 wow. minutes <laughs> yeah that's damn the fake hair i can't get over that that's <laughs> yeah the false yeah. hair it's like uh, actually at my gate drum like so we braid the hair and then we tie it to our belt so it doesn't like fly all over the place right. when we're dancing and in the middle of my like main like my my 30 minute piece um mm-hmm. my the yarn snapped because i was spinning mm. and the hair like whipped around and like whipped me in the front and flew back and it was loose for the rest of the piece like the braid was just flying around yeah and I literally was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Cause I'm like, it's like this, the, the braid itself is like a couple yeah. pounds. Right. So I'm like, this like super heavy thing is just like making me like off center. And I just had to keep dancing. Like wow. I was in the middle of the piece. That's crazy. And also like another thing is like uh, in Barthanagium, like one thing I find really cool actually is we dance to a live orchestra. Like it's not recorded music. Right. Right. Um, like the Murdungam so, player is right there. And, yeah. Like, like yeah. which it's it, like my editing drum was like one of my favorite performance experiences because I was performing with like five other people it mm-hmm. wasn't just me on the stage which I I think is really cool but at the same time if something goes wrong you can't you can't just be like pause the music I'll be back like yeah they're, they're yeah there, no like, I feel that yourself. did yeah. your did your dance teacher and stuff like make fun of you afterwards like <laughs> was she like yeah. oh I saw the braid just snapping around like, <laughs> yeah. I like I came up because it was after that piece, like I was only done with half my Udinger drum. Like I had to keep going. Yeah. So my teacher was like retying it and she was like, it's okay. If it comes off, you just keep going. You did the right thing. And I was like, oh God, okay. Oh, cause you do Please. get the break in between, right? Yeah. Yeah. You get a break to change the costume in between. Um, yeah. So yeah, during, the, thankfully like the piece was right before the break. So I had yeah. to change anyway. So they were like retying it. And they put like five yards. They were like, it's not coming out again. Don't worry. <laughs> that's that's crazy so like what is like the reaction like i did you like not fully process that you had gone through an r and gate trim like until like a couple days later like like because it's like i feel like during like the half like at the intermission like it's just kind of like you're just trying to like remember the next thing and like trying to like go on and like figure it out like when did you fully process like holy crap i really did that like i like i I feel like i still like haven't um i I look back at my other engagement videos and i'm like how 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 did I manage that right, like I right. even now like I'm nowhere near at that like fitness level to pull that off again yeah. but I think like it, it's it is crazy it's like it was like the most like hyped up moment of my life like <laughs> like there was so much a lead up right because yeah. at, when you start dancing you hear about all these girls who do their unengaged room and then as you're dancing like for, for me like I think I'm lucky in that my teacher never really made it like the end all be all like like how it seems like she was like mm-hmm. you learn if, if one day I think you're, like, actually she, she always like, she's kind of brutal. She'd be like, no, you're not ready. Like you're, you're definitely not there. Yeah. And she'd kind of say that. So I grew up with like the mindset, like, oh, I'm never doing my wedding drum. I'm never going to be good enough. But then one day my teacher was like, I think you're ready. And I was like, wait, 
what? Like after 10 years yeah. of telling me that I'm literally <laughs> never going to dance on stage, you're like, I think you're ready. And so then I spent like one year kind of like, just like being more serious about dance. And then I spent one year like formally preparing, learning the yeah. pieces, like training every day. Um, and I would like practice at like five in the morning, do like one round of the piece, like with my mom watching and my wow. mom would give me feedback. Then I'd go to school and come home and then go to practice wow. um, in front of my teacher. And like, it was, it was a struggle. Like, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm like, I still don't know how I did that. Cause I could, cannot even bring myself to wake up at like 10 AM now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that might just be like the college life yeah. kicking in. So like, but... <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Damn. Yeah. So like, what was your practice schedule like? Like, tell me, tell me about that. Um, yeah, so I, in the beginning, I would practice like once after school every day as I was yeah. learning the pieces and I'd go to class like two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, by the end of it, like I was practicing like my full, like my full set, like twice a day, because my teacher would always like say this, she'd be like, you will dance a hundred percent in class. If you dance a hundred percent in class, you're only going to dance 60% on stage because you have to take off 40% for the, the weight of the costume, like the right. harsh lights, um, like just exhaustion in general. Yeah. Um, so she was like, you have to dance 200% in class if you want to get like 90% on the stage. That's interesting. So, yeah. so like the policy was like wake up do the do the piece when you're super like right. do the whole set when you're really tired like five in the morning six in the morning then i'd go to school and i'd honestly like man sophomore year classes like i was like asleep in most of my classes like, just struggling towards the end of the year i was like just not having it and then um yeah then I, in the evening like as it got closer to the day because i did my editing term over the summer like i'd go to yeah. class like four or five times a week and in the summer, I'd go to class like almost every day or every other day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it was, it was definitely rigorous. But I also feel like that year like taught me how to work super hard, For like sure. I had to manage school and I didn't get trim. So I got this kind of confidence. It's like even though I like feel like dying right now, like I can push myself to the limit and it'll be fine. Yeah. Wow. That's I mean the whole like practicing like every day like five of them. It kind of almost reminds me of like athletes like pro athlete like it's it's kind of like a like an athlete type of type of schedule yeah. where it's like actually wake up we practice go to school do whatever you have to do come home practice go to practice again like it's just repetition go 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 and that's that's so cool to me though like yeah. yeah um i mean yeah because like you have to memorize all the like imagine like I danced in front of like 600 people and like say if I had stage fright and blanked out like muscle memory just kicks in so you have to practice enough so that you right. don't freeze up on the day mm -hmm. did you ever feel like you were freezing up like in that in that in the moment or like you were just like I I know exactly what I'm doing I'm just exiting. actually I think I've been I've been lucky in that like for dance I've never felt stage fright like my whole life like I've always been yeah. like I feel like this stage is like a very natural place for me in dance like when it comes to public speaking or singing it's like another story like I'm like a nervous wreck yeah. but for dance I've like always felt confident so of course there was like that nervousness before I went on before my first piece because I was like literally like I've been working for like 10 years for this mm -hmm. moment my parents have put in so much time effort and money for this yeah. my teacher like you know there's a lot riding on this and I don't want to disappoint anyone right and you but got a crowd was, full of your friends, like in attendance exactly. too, right? And that's, yeah. a, that's the first time like my high school friends and like people that like didn't really know that I danced, like saw me dance. Like mm -hmm. so many people in my life were like, wait, oh yeah, like we know you dance, but we don't really know what you do. Right. Um, and so the, like, I just didn't want to like, I, I really didn't want to disappoint anybody. So I was like, that stress was definitely there. But For like, sure. but after like the second or third piece, like the, the set was like eight pieces long. So after the first couple, like I, literally to this day I'm like that's definitely the happiest I've ever been like right. my happiest moment because I was just on stage like I couldn't even see anyone in the audience because of the lights and it was just like me and the music and it was it was really it great. was just you right and it was just like you were doing your thing and it was like and it was like all the payout and like it's just yeah, it was, it was great moment, for sure right? one of the best moments that's crazy I mean that because it's like I feel like athletes work to a championship and it's like you guys work to this our engagement to this performance and it's like dang that's, yeah that's insane a funny story I actually like I didn't want, like because of I didn't get to and all that I didn't have time to do PE in high school like I did yeah. PE freshman year but sophomore year I didn't do it and so I petitioned to get like individual like ISPE you should you should have gotten it yeah. but yeah like but like the school was like no because you don't compete and then I literally wrote like this five-page essay what about, like, you don't compete 
Yeah. yeah, I was like, I don't compete, but like I put so much time into this and like they eventually like approved it and they were like, okay, it's fine. Like we don't want to read your essay, just it's fine. <laughs> dude, yeah, what? That's fucking our high school, dude. Really? You don't compete? You should be like, come to my practice. I'll show you what I do every day. <laughs> like, I want to see you try. <laughs> yeah, actually like it's interesting because I like I always wanted that like athlete like competition because I feel like the, like the competitions can be really fun right and like games mm-hmm. and how it, how it actually works in sports and in college like I joined the Bartonatium dance team at Cal oh nice um and like we competed so that was the first time I ever competed like with the dance team yeah and it's like the best of both worlds because like yeah we still put in those like grueling hours like every weekday we'd practice from like 9 to 12 at night Mm -hmm. and um like it was it was like I honestly got like unengaged from like flashbacks to like our practice schedule but it was like crazy because there was like 10 other dancers who like all wanted the same thing and I got that like team vibe Mm -hmm. um and like obviously competing and like winning was like like a lot of fun so so they have classical competitions in college too yeah like there's like a classical collegiate circuit like that's dope yeah, like a lot of colleges in big cities will have like Bartonatium teams, right? Because of like the diversity. Right. Um, and yeah, like it, it's really cool because you meet a lot of like other dancers from other colleges who are super serious about dance and like are really good too. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's really crazy when you're like, man, I'm like not like everybody around me is like so much better than me. And that's so inspiring. Yeah. yeah. So you talked about, you talked about earlier about like how you did, I mean, obviously you did Bomb in the Bay in high school. You were heavily involved in like the Bollywood dance for our high school. Those of you that don't know, Bomb in the Bay is like a huge, absolute massive deal at our high school. Um, you know, we have too many brownies, so we get that. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, it's, it's all Bollywood dancing, a lot of bunger, a lot of different styles are on display. And Sanjana was in like seven different dances. She's insane. Uh, and she like our senior year. And so, she did that and she also like experimented with I presume like Bunger and other styles so like what what do you like like do you like certain things about those compared to Bharatanatyam or like what what's your feeling like compared to Bollywood yeah see I'm not like a professional Bollywood or Bunger dancer and Mm -hmm. I definitely don't want to say that those art forms like don't require work because they definitely do right like I'm just like some amateur who is learning from YouTube videos right but I feel like having those art forms as art forms that I did for fun like not seriously like just learning from YouTube videos Mm -hmm. dancing with my friends like I think that was so great and like a different kind of happiness especially like as frustrating as some of the practices could be like it was just so fun to like dance with like our huge group and um like bond over like you know horrific co-ed practices oh my god (laughs) don't even remind me dude it's actually around that time of year isn't that crazy yeah oh my god it is february wait really i think this would have been the weekend oh yeah wait this was oh weekend. shit <laughs> like this today look at this like divine timing oh my god wow it's been, it? what, two, it's been two it's been two years, years right? two years wow. since our last one that's insane dude wow i did not pick this on purpose so like <laughs> i you didn't just, realize you just i just i mean i didn't i guess the universe just lined up like it wow yeah. so like yeah for those of you that don't know this would have been like our performance day uh for Bombay in the Bay it's, it happens on this weekend in February every year so but COVID so I don't know if it's still happening um, actually my my brother's a freshman right now and they're doing like virtual practices and stuff <laughs> it's so funny like my my brother like was learning their their Bombay in the Bay dance and he came yeah. and showed it to me and he was like help like I don't know like freshman boys Bollywood like what a throwback <laughs> oh man that was what oh my gosh almost five years ago six years ago wow crazy insane um and I I actually want to go back to that whole thing we were talking about earlier with like the relationships between the teacher and the student uh I've heard uh and this is again my sources here are not like very you know reputable people I've heard through the auntie grapevine is what I'll call it uh that there's a lot of like inner competition between like the studios and like between like the Indian dance studios and like the gurus and the teachers and it can get really bitter from what I've heard like explain like what that whole like mom student teacher like weird relationship is like and does it get bitter like is that true honestly like I think it does for sure like it's a bunch of I don't want to like throw any shade here but like it's just a bunch of like Indian moms and Indian girls and like 
uh, like I think like with these communities comes a lot of drama and for it's sure. highly yeah. unnecessary. It's also like part of that toxic like Indian culture where it's like competitiveness. Oh, look what her daughter's doing. Yeah, look what this yeah. person's doing. And then it's like, I don't know, highly unnecessary. Um, I think like in my dance school, like it's it's definitely more of a community. Like we all, I, I, I think I'm really lucky to have a good dance teacher, good dance community. Like mm -hmm. we all help each other out. Like it's actually sweet. Like all the moms like, help for the out engage from like they all get together and like help get the, the whoever's dancing ready awesome. and like it's like this yeah. whole like assembly line but i know inevitably there's like competition because everybody wants like their child to like look the best or whatever right. it is right especially because dance is such a like physical art form like you're, you're put on stage and right. you're like you're just being judged by off of your movements so everybody's mm -hmm. always commenting and you know there's like that really toxic like oh fair skin girls look better on stage dark skin like there's all of that yeah. but i feel like in my dance school like i haven't personally witnessed any of that i've heard horror stories from yeah. like friends who've learned yeah. from other teachers and like there is like that competitiveness and because because like the student teacher relationship is so deep like people can get really offended when like the student leaves or quits or joins okay. another school so it's like imagine like if, if I transferred out of Berkeley to like, you know, some other school, like mm -hmm. my Berkeley professor is not going to come like hunt me down and hate me. Right. It's like, oh, you just didn't like Berkeley wasn't a fit for you. So you moved to another school. Right. But I feel like that's the problem here. Like some teachers take it really, really personally. Like they're like because of the personal relationship, it's inevitable. It's like it's like kind of like disowning like a parent or something. So yeah, sure. that's where a lot of the drama comes. It's like, oh, my student moved somewhere else or like this school is doing something differently. And like, it's so unnecessary. Like, I feel like me and my mom like yeah. stayed out of it. We were just like, please, no, no thanks. <laughs> like, I'm good, <laughs> dude. Yeah, no, I mean, I totally get where you're coming from when it comes to drama. Like when you gather a bunch of brown people together, there's drama, okay? Bombay in the Bay was filled with that, all right? Oh yeah. Dealt with that, I'm done. Uh, but like, <laughs> you know, so like, I, I totally feel you on that and like, that's, I mean, yeah, when you put Indian moms and Indian teachers and, you know, just and girls who are, you know, just trying to like balance both worlds together, like it, it can get chaotic. Like, yeah, I feel yeah. like it, people just don't understand that like there truly is room in the world for everyone to succeed. Like there is space. Like, I don't know why everybody acts mm -hmm. like there's only three spots left for the top dancer. Like there really isn't. Like if you want to actually like, like I see like dancers around me who get like performance opportunities, right? Like they get like they they get these auditions and it's like I don't get these opportunities. So I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna like make a YouTube channel and make videos and I'm right. happy with that because like that's success in my eyes. And like yeah. I'm happy and I'm dancing and that's like I'm happy now. So mm -hmm. like I feel like that's what people don't understand. They're like, if I'm not in the lime like absolute limelight, like I, I'm like failing For or sure. like worse than others, yeah. which I'm like, it just needs to stop because like it would be so much better if we all just encouraged each other and we're like like that's so cool that you're like dancing 100 like, percent. enough yeah i mean art is just that's it should be that way but it never exactly. has been like it's it's yeah. always people trying to compete but yeah. you were talking about your youtube channel and i wanted to hit on this before we left uh and first of all loving the new mashups that you're doing like the the i was telling you off air like the jazz pot the jazz and the uh the barthenatium mix was super cool um thought it was like you know, it was an absolutely flame mashup. Uh, and then you guys did the one based on Avatar as well. Uh, I was watching both of those, both really well done. Um, and like, I felt like I could understand both of them because like, you know, I, I didn't need to like know a language or any of that, mm -hmm. but like, so that was super cool. So like, take me through the process of like why you were inspired to do those things and like, uh, and make those videos. And like, what's that, uh, what's the process with your YouTube channel been like so far? Yeah, so um, this this all started with Jivano, which I mentioned earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Like the huge scale production. And I feel like I love creating performances and like working towards shows because like I truly like, I love dancing on stage, um, which is why I did Bombay in the Bay in high school. Like it's just so fun for me. And then I think when quarantine hit, I was like, and like in college, I joined the dance team at Berkeley called right. Natya and we performed like across the country and we had performances in Berkeley. So I was get, kind of getting that fill for dance. But then when quarantine hit, we like obviously all got sent home and no performances. Like I was like, just like bored and like, yeah. I guess like I, I can practice dance, but I also get like really motivated when I'm like working towards a project, right? Like something 
tangible. So I talked to my like childhood dance friend, Smriti, um, and we've, we've been dancing together since like we were 10 years old. So known her for like a really long time. Mm -hmm. And we've like over quarantine, we started, we just started, we this started out by us just kind of practicing together. Like we would just like, let's practice together. So we stay in shape and like, remember how to dance, <laughs> not forget all this. Um, and then it just turned into like these late night Zoom calls where we'd be talking about like, we just have like long conversations about how we feel like Bharatanatyam is so structured and rigid and like it's just stuck in a time era that's like not modern right and it's like stuck in this really ancient era and we we're like how can we bring this like to things that like people will enjoy it really doesn't have to be anything too serious like I just want like the fact that you said you enjoyed jazz jetty is like truly like the goal has been achieved right like somebody who <laughs> could like would not like choose to click on a Bharatanatyam video like watched it fully like I feel like that's like that's absolutely amazing yeah, super cool. and so we, we we were just talking about that and like she we were talking about how like we have like two ideas like one is to just like comment on the problems that kind of like this world is facing right now because as artists like like art can move and change people's mindsets right sure. and if we can somehow use Bharatanatyam to maybe like change views in the Desi community or like ideally even extend past the Desi community like mm -hmm. that would be amazing and then another idea is just to like take western themes and an Indian like an Indian dance and put them together and ideally like our goal is to like meet dancers like of all different styles and like try to combine it and like com come up with like really like like, I don't know, like ballet and Bharatanatyam or tap and Bharatanatyam and like, just like try to like learn more about global art forms. Um, so yeah, so we were just like, okay, one step at a time, let's like start making a video. And um, like uh, we asked Divya, who is like an amazing filmmaker. Yes. Um, she's been, she's been shooting my, yeah, shout out to Divya, honestly. Um, <laughs> she's been shooting my dance videos since freshman year. And like, she, she literally like, anytime I'm like, hey, Divya, I have a project. She's like, okay, I'm on my way. And like, <laughs> so I, I just asked her, I was like, so Smriti and I have an idea for like, um, a piece about COVID, like just doing a piece about how people, like some people wear masks and some people don't, right. And feel like mm -hmm. not wearing masks is like fine. And we were like, we just want to like, showcase this the struggle in mindset right and so we did like some research and it was honestly really hard to empathize with the side that doesn't wear masks as people who like care about social distancing but like as we thought about it more we were like they're not evil people they just like either don't have the education or in like information to care so we we depicted the story of like two people who were friends but then when covid hit like one of them was like did not want to wear a mask and the other person wore a mask because they had like like they were immunocompromised and then at the end like these two this friend realizes like I need to wear a mask to protect them because they're immunocompromised so it doesn't matter like what I think like I should do it for my friend yeah. so it started off with that and we were like we got a lot of positive feedback from that um and like a lot of encouragement from our family and stuff so yeah. then we watched Avatar together and we're like <laughs> literally like the air bending water bending fire bending it it translates so directly to like Indian like um like like nature depiction Absolutely. in Bharatanatyam mm -hmm. so we we're like we can definitely like try to do something so we um we choreographed that for fun and um we were like I don't know if we're going to be exposed as like big nerds but whatever we're putting it out that's there in the fine. I thought it was super cool like even the COVID thing like that's so like needed like within our society you know and like it's always cool to have artists comment on events that are taking place and like yeah. use creative formats to do this and I feel like with Bharatanatyam this is like something that really hasn't been done before and like you guys are really doing something that is absolutely like it's first of all it's awesome and the quality is incredible and obviously Divya does a fantastic job with the filmmaking so shout out again shout uh, out. and but like it's just like I feel like we need more of that we need more of like Desi culture and like these little niche things that people don't really talk about and just like kind of bring it to light and you guys are doing a fantastic job with it for sure thank you yeah I think like our goal is like we're we identify as like Indian Americans and like we have to create that identity somehow right um it's not just like learning Indian things or living in America and like just doing Bharatanatyam and like mm -hmm. for me I, I always thought like I have to move to India to succeed in Bharatanatyam but like that's so not true like you just like especially with the jazz jet the idea I think um we really like had fun with that because we were like yeah. what if we pretend we're like gonna start like a western jazz concert and then we just like break out into dance that was and, sick um, it was so cool and like we took the whole idea of like jazz improvisation right like when the background like the background musicians are all like 
sticking to one beat and then one person kind of goes off right that's like the jazz format so we did that too um and we had like we each had a solo moment where we came up with whatever we wanted and then the background people had the instruments and um it was also like such a challenge to do that virtually because we did all the practices over zoom mm -hmm. um and like yeah our, our other friend shiny like she we, we did it completely virtually so we never met up once for this and um yeah so i mean it was it was really fun and That's i think cool. we're like super inspired now especially because we've been sharing it like on facebook we definitely don't have like a huge viewership but like whatever yeah. support we get is like definitely appreciated and we're like really excited to keep making videos y'all know what to do i mean her their sanjay's youtube channel is called what is it fuchisa dance how do you say fuchsia it? dance fuchsia, fuchsia dance. dance fuchsia dance sorry for completely butchering the name <laughs> fuchsia dance I'm going to link it down below. Make sure y'all go check that out. Cause I mean, they're doing fantastic things and they're only going to continue to make more videos. At least I think. Right. Thank you. Yes. I have to say it like comment, subscribe. Woo! Yeah. You know, what's up? Smash the fucking like button on her <laughs> videos and also destroy the subscribe button. We are making Sanjana blow up to the moon like GameStop. Uh, yes. We're going to make sure that happens, but uh, and with that, Sanjana, uh, thank you so, so much for coming on the podcast today and educating me on Bharatanatyam, which is a topic I do not have a lot of expertise in. Uh, and I think my parents are going to be happy that I talked a little bit about South Indian dancing. And uh, Thank you so yeah. much. This is so fun. And I um, love the podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And oh, wait, one last question before we end it. I, was, I've, I started this segment and I'm going to start it because last week, my boy Brian, shout out, was uh, the first person to like flip the interview on me. And he was like asking me questions. So I'm going to start doing this at the end of every episode. Like, do you have any questions for me? Anything you can ask? Whatever. Um, let me think about it. Okay. If you could have anybody on your podcast, who would it be? <laughs> um man that, that's a tough one because there's so many people i really would love to have but the number one name that i would probably pick right right now um would honestly probably be well and because i've put it out in the world by episode 100 i want hassan minaj on the podcast and so i would Ooh. say i would say that i, I would get hassan and uh i would because i think he would just be such a fun interview uh and i've been following him since i was since before he got famous like way before like 2013 2014 so uh i think it would be super cool to uh to have a conversation with him so yeah. I think oh my God. It. It's going to happen. Uh, by episode 100. If any of you can make that happen, please. I would. Have I you tried you. reaching out to him? Not yet. No. Um, but I definitely need to, I uh, definitely need to get a jump start on that. Uh, but like, I feel like there's so many other people I want to interview too. Like I have so many, like, just like, I think of other people like off the top of my head every day. Like I'm like, Oh shit, that would be so dope. Or like, Oh crap. That's awesome. Like, my dream has always been to like interview a Niner or a warrior. Like I mm. want to make that happen so, so bad. And I've like been shooting my shot and trying and uh, you know, things are, things are happening, but like nothing, uh, nothing set in stone yet. So uh, we're going to see what happens with that. But uh, I'm really hoping that I can get a famous basketball player or football player on the, on the podcast. Honestly, day. keep that, keep that list, like keep that list with you. You're going to get it for yeah, sure. Yeah. But Hassan by episode 100. So let's call it hashtag quest for Hassan. Uh, All right. So let's see what happens. But thank you again, Sajida, so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Y'all know what to do. I'm going to link her YouTube channel down below. So check out the sick Barthanatium slash jazz mashup that just came out. Sure, there's going to be more YouTube videos coming out as well. There's going to be more content coming out on this podcast. And y'all know it. And y'all know what to do. You got to smash this like button. Subscribe to my channel. Hopefully, I have all my social media channels down below as well. So hit the link and follow me there. But with that, we're done. So uh, thank you guys so much. And Sanjana, thank you. You enjoyed that episode with Sanjana and that, and that this topic of Indian classical dance was something that interested you as much as it did myself. For me, this is an episode I love since I was someone that really had a lot of preconceived notions when it came to Indian classical dance. And this episode really helped me learn a lot more about the craft and the incredible process that dancers go through for the performance and what happens after that culminating performance is done. 
Also, I loved when we talked about the problems that go on in the dance community and within these dance studios here in the Bay Area and I'm sure across the country and how there are a lot of legit issues that stick with people for a while, even after dancing and Bharatanatyam and classical dance is long gone. If you want to check out, check out Sanjana on YouTube with her new projects that she's working on, I'm going to link her YouTube channel down below so you guys can go check her out, like the videos, subscribe to her channel, show her all the love you can. Uh, my socials, as usual, will be linked down below as well, so go check me out on Instagram and Twitter uh, to get all the updates for the episodes and when they're going to drop. Uh, if you're on YouTube right now, smash the fuck out of the like button and smash that subscribe button as well. We would love if you could do that. We've been growing here like crazy, and so join the fam. It's going to be a fun ride, trust me. Uh, love to have new people, so welcome if you are new. Uh, and if you're on Spotify, hit that follow button. Uh, it continues to help us once again, so it's a good time, and uh, I promise I will not let any of you down. Feel free to also go check out my website in the link tree link down below, and listener support. Any support that you guys could give me would be much appreciated, so thank you. Anywho, uh, that's all I got. Uh, check out the links down below for both me and Sanjana. And uh, should be back sometime this week with the thought of the week. I know I've been absolutely pathetic when it's come to podcast stuff. So uh, I got to post one soon. But uh, I promise I will. It'll happen this week. We're counting on it. So uh, thank you guys uh, so much for listening to the episode. And peace.